Hi, I'm Justin Genst, a doctoral student here in the Department of Government at the LSC. Thanks for tuning in to this month's edition of The Hot Seat. Uh, today with us is Professor of European and Comparative Politics, Simon Hicks. We'll be focusing on the comparative side of his specialty, uh, as we'll be discussing the American election and the primaries ongoing right now across the pond. Professor Hicks, let's start off with the first question. Many people in Europe are still learning just who John McCain is. He stopped uh, by 10 Downing Street uh, just last week, actually, to meet with Gordon Brown, but he no doubt remains in the shadows of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton abroad. What about John McCain, do you think, and his ideas should Britain and Europe really know about and be most interested in hearing? Well, McCain um, is um, an interesting character from a European point of view in that he's not really a traditional mainstream Republican. Um, he's a bit of a maverick inside his own party. He's got very strong views. He is quite moderate on some issues, and I think some of the international media portrays him as a relatively moderate character um, by American Republican standards. So he, um, he sponsored several bipartisan bills in Congress uh, for campaign finance reform. Um, he was in favor of quite a moderate position on immigration um, and uh, sided with some of the Democrats on immigration issues. He's also got a relatively moderate position on gun control. Um, but on some of the social questions, um, like abortion, for example, he's quite socially conservative. He's, he is quite traditional. He's been moving in a more socially conservative direction um, as part of this presidential election campaign. So the last time he stood um, in the primaries, in the Republican primaries five years ago, he was fighting as a sort of the liberal wing of the Republican Party. This time he's fighting it as a much more mainstream, socially conservative candidate to try and capture the, the religious right uh, within the Republican Party. So it's a, there's, a little, there's a little bit of uncertainty about what he really represents and where he will position himself come the election in November and the campaign in November. Well, as you mentioned, John McCain has never been a big fan of George W. Bush. In fact, at one point, their relationship was so sour that he even considered uh, switching parties. However, McCain remains a strong supporter of the Bush administration's war in Iraq. Will this define McCain's image to the world, and will his campaign hinge on the progress of the war in Iraq? He, he's in a very difficult situation because his position on Iraq is not identical to the Bush administration's position. He, he in fact, is, is, is very critical of the way they have managed the war in Iraq. He's in favour of the war in Iraq in a sense that he's quite a, he, he, he's, he's a hawk when it comes to security issues. He believes that it was right to have military intervention, but he thinks that not enough troops were sent. He was very critical of Cheney, critical of Rumsfeld and the way the war was managed. He believed from the start that they should have sent him you know, much more force really demonstrated the power of American might. Um, this would have been a strong signal to the world. If you're going to do it, do it properly, is his view. This is why he was in favor when they talked about the surge in troops, sending more troops. He was in favor of sending even more troops. And he's saying, if you're going to do the job, do it properly, because it, otherwise it's not worth doing it at all. It's a high-risk strategy for him. But, I mean, it's, it's hard to know. It's hard to read the signs. And who knows where Iraq is going to be come November? I mean, all of, we're starting to see some signs that some elements of the surge seem to be working. Iraq is starting to calm down. Um, you, you know, so the, the economy is gradually starting to be rebuilt. People's lives are gradually starting to be rebuilt. Security situation is gradually getting better. Now, if that continues in that trajectory by November, he can say that he was right. He can say that he's been right, that we just – you cannot – uh, categorically say it was wrong to send in the troops into Iraq to, to undertake the Iraq war. It's just too early to tell. And in the long term, if the long term is a stable Iraq, a democratic Iraq, he can say, I was right all the way along. Right now, we might say if the war was wrong and the overwhelming public opinion in Europe um, is that the Europeans view that this is a terrible campaign by the US. It was a mistake to fight the Iraq war. Um, but we don't know in six months or a year or several years' time whether or not, in hindsight, we'll still be able to say that. And that's what McCain is banking on. Now, I know you're a big fan of statistics. Uh, in a recent Gallup poll of American voters, there are indications that one product of the tough primary election between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton may be that supporters of the loser may bitterly defect to McCain. What is the best resolution of this primary that the Democratic Party can reasonably hope for? The best resolution for the, the Democratic Party with the primary is that they get it over quickly. Um, the, you know, even, even if it runs till the end of the primary season, even if it runs all the way to, the, to the, the Democratic Convention, that even if it runs all that way, they can then, it, 
say it's done, we've picked somebody, and we then go and fight the campaign together. I just don't believe voters who are now telling pollsters, like you know, the latest data is coming out where you've got Clinton supporters saying, I'm not going to vote for Obama, I will either abstain or vote for McCain. And there's a certain percentage of Obama supporters who are saying, I just don't believe that. That's cheap talk. They're saying that to pollsters because they're threatening to try and encourage the rest of the party to support their candidate. You know, they will be upset, they'll be bitter for a few weeks, but if Clinton comes out strongly in support of Obama after the convention, or vice versa, then I think, you know, all bets are off, and we'll be back into the national election campaign, Republicans versus Democrats. Well, it may all come down to superdelegates, and of course, as you probably know, superdelegates are the about 800 Democratic Party officials who will submit their votes at the party's national convention this summer. With the primary race this close, the swing of those 800 delegates very well may determine the outcome of this election. And indeed, if she ends up losing the primary election race, Hillary Clinton could still salvage the nomination with extraordinary superdelegate support. Now, some may call this undemocratic, but either way, delegates have a choice of voting the way of their constituencies or the way of their personal judgment. My question for you is, which way should they vote? And also, if a legislative history, which you've studied quite a bit, is a guide in politics, which way will they vote in the end? I think that the answer is the same for those two things. I think it's going to be a big mistake for the party if the superdelegates overturn what I think the public will see as the, man, the, the public mandate for a candidate. And we're already seeing that in the way the delegates are already committing themselves to the candidates. A few months ago, it was overwhelming that the superdelegates were committing themselves for Clinton, two to one for Clinton. And you know, the New York Times and Associated Press do polls every week of the superdelegates. And gradually, we're starting to see the pendulum switch, the pendulum swing back towards Obama. The, the pled, there's about 450 of the 800 and something superdelegates have already pledged support to one or other of the candidates. And currently, Obama and Clinton are running about even amongst those superdelegates. The remaining you know, 250 to 210, um, the remaining 200 or so are waiting. But even if Obama, I, my guess is that Obama is going to be 100, 150 delegates ahead come the convention. Um, I don't think that there's going to be enough superdelegates to break in favor of Clinton to, to actually swing it for her. She's banking on the fact that she's going to win Pennsylvania. But even if she wins Pennsylvania, she's only going to make up 20 or so delegates on Obama. And he's going to win it back straight away the next week in some of the smaller primaries in North Carolina and so on. So my guess is that come the convention, he's still going to be 150 ahead and the superdelegates are going to break relatively evenly for the two. I, don't, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on them from the party, from the media, to say, even if you really think that, Clint, that Clinton is a better candidate, it just looks terrible for the party if they even personally believe Clinton's better, that they do go and vote for Clinton over Obama in the convention and win it for her very narrowly. Because then that's playing into the hands of McCain and the Republicans and the talk show radio and the Republican media machine or the rest of it, who can then say, look, you know, if she fights the campaign, who are you? You weren't even elected by your voters to come and fight against us. Obama's the real candidate for you. You know, why should we accept you as legitimate? And it leads to a whole range of very, very difficult questions for her. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's under different conditions with a different candidate, with a different person, with the different people around them. I think they would have already retired from the campaign and already withdrawn and already say, I support the, the leading candidate. Obama is the leading candidate now, and I really don't think Clinton is going to win back enough to win it back. And one of the interesting things that really suggests that this is the case is the betting on the uh, uh, electronic markets. In America, you're not allowed to actually bet on, ca on the election campaigns as you are in the, a lot of places in Europe. But what you can do is you can buy shares or buy futures in which candidate you think is going to win the nomination and which candidate you think is going to win the campaign. So there's two interesting things here. One of them is what the price of Obama and Clinton shares are for winning the nomination. So Obama's running at 75 cents for the dollar. So if you buy a share of Obama for 75 cents and he wins, you get a dollar back. For Clinton, she's running at about 25 cents. So you buy her at 20. So people who are buying market shares and who they think is going to win the nomination are betting three to one that Obama's going to win. Um, the nomination. And previous history has shown that these electronic markets are much better predictors of outcomes than opinion polls, because it's nerdy political science professors like me who are actually trading on these shares, and we're following them daily and trying to work out who's going to win. The other interesting thing, the second interesting fact, is what the prices are actually for November. Um, a few weeks ago, the Democrats were running way ahead 
So any candidate up against McCain was running, running sort of 60-40 percentage of the Democrats likely to win against the Republicans in November. It's narrowed dramatically. It's now down to 55-45, and it's going to be neck and neck, I think, come November, McCain versus either Hillary or Obama. Well, you might be pioneering a new predictive method for elections. Um, You've studied these elections and legislative politics in many different democratic countries over the years. Has another party in another country ever experienced a divide anything like the Democrats divide right now? And either way, will America's disillusionment with George W. Bush have an impact? No other party in any other system that I know of has had this sort of down-to-the-wire battle between two leading figures. And this is partly because most parties don't have this sort of primary system um, so close to an election, if you like, or, or such a long primary season. So if you think the you know, presidential election campaign runs over two years, well, one and a half years of that is the primary, and then the last kind of four to six months is the final election campaign. And people are exhausted by the last few months and, and the coffers are empty for campaign spending and the rest of it. Um, most other systems have much shorter truncated campaigns and a much smaller part of that truncated campaign is the, elect is the choice of the leader who's going to be fighting. Um, and the choice of the leader is often inherited. Um, it's the previous leader who lost. Or if you lose the previous election, the decision is made there and then to choose the person who's going to run in five years' time so they can then build up their sort of portfolio and image amongst the voters against the people they're standing against a long way in advance. So the, the American system is almost unique in the way that it has this primary system. Um, but on the other hand, you can say, you know, you can say this is damaging for the Democrats or damaging for the fact that voters might get exhausted by this kind of thing. But on the other hand, I, you know, this is actually very positive, I think, for, the, for American image in the world. You know, American image in the world is going down because of the, Clint, because of the Bush uh, administration, the war in Iraq, uh, general opposition to America in other parts of the, not just the democratic world, but the non-democratic world. We've seen it in Europe, declining trust in America, um, growing opposition to America. What is happening over the last few months is quite interesting because it's an image of America that's very different. It's an image of it being a very vibrant, very democratic society where you can talk about pretty much everything in an election campaign. And the, you know, the fact that we've got a woman and a black candidate fighting out for the Democratic nomination and the likelihood that either one of these two would be either the first woman or the first black president of the United States, I think is very positive image, for, um, very positive sort of message for the standing of America in the world. All right. Well done. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hicks. You are off the hot seat. Uh, Professor Simon Hicks, a professor of European and comparative politics here at the LSE and author of a new book, What's Wrong with the European Union and How to Fix It just came out and uh, is available at bookshops everywhere around the world, I imagine, certainly around Europe. Um, we thank you for your time and we thank you for your time listening. And please tune in next month for another edition of The Hot Seat.